Let's jump in into this reading. Now, look here, there's something rather curious going on between the two gentlemen, Plato and Plotinus. The whole symposium of Plato starts out from this point, a contrast between love and cognitive functions. By that, knowledge, opinion, understanding, ignorance. <coughs> Ignorance is a cognitive function. <clears throat> so Socrates is brought to see that from Diotima, his teacher, that love is neither beautiful nor good. And Socrates comes back and he says, good heavens, does that mean love must be ugly and bad? He goes for opposites, see? Now, look here. What's most curious about this is that to make this point clear, Diotima says, hey, wait a minute. Don't you think there's something between these two, these opposites? And he introduces the idea, if you think it's ugly and bad, <clears throat> shouldn't there be some gap between these? So he suggests uh, the contrast of knowing or wisdom and ignorance. See, they're opposites. And he says, look here. <clears throat> if they're opposites here, there could be a mean between them. There must be something between them. Well, then equally well, there should be something between these opposites. But this is expressed negatively not positively. So then he introduces this curious reasoning. He says the thing between these two things is understanding And then, in his reasoning, he offers up another one between these two, and that is right opinion. And he points out, hey, look here. These are between these extremes. Now, he then goes on to define what he means by these two. And understanding is that you're able to reason your way through something, but you don't know whether it's true or false. And right opinion is when you happen to be right, but you don't have any understanding of why it's right. Right? It's finished. Now look here, he left these two he never, he doesn't explain them until he finishes the myth of poverty, plenty, and love. Then he introduces 
the meaning of these two terms. So let's put it this way, okay? As he explores the idea of love, right? we can say he brackets it between, right? Brackets it. So here's the myth or the legend of poverty, plenty, and love. So this precedes it. And when he finishes that myth, then he returns to explain these two terms. What does that mean? Structurally, he's talking about how to understand these mean terms within the extremes of ignorance and wisdom. Now, isn't that rather curious? Let me do it again. Socrates offers this alternative. He says, oh, hey, hey, hey. If, <laughs> if love is neither beautiful nor good, it must be its opposite, therefore it must be ugly and bad. His teacher, Diotima, says, nah, kid, you got it wrong. You think if, if something isn't knowing or wisdom, it must be ignorance. Uh oh. And then argues that there must be something in between these two. Then he describes understanding and right opinion. Does not, re does not explore these two, but unfolds this whole myth about poverty, plenty, and love, which is the subject of Plotinus' study of Eros or love. So look here. Um, Latinus gives some very fine insights into the myth of poverty, plenty, and life. But according to the structure, we should be able to take it and use it to understand these two ideas since they're bracketing the myth. Or he's a very foolish thinker because, look here, put it in other terms. These are the mean between knowledge or wisdom and ignorance. Just as he argues that there's a mean between wisdom and ignorance. What the heck is going on in this rather curious dialogue? Did you, did you mean that understanding and right opinion are the mean? Or did you mean the myth is the mean? Because you were pointing at the myth. So. After this point, Diotima raises that she, she, she wants to know there must be something between them. And she mentions understanding and right opinion and defines them does not explore these two terms, but introduces this myth, and only at its completion does he go back and throw light on these two ideas. Therefore, it looks like, just as these terms are the mean terms between these two extremes, so is the myth the mean between these two extremes. Right. So, look here. <clears throat> look what he's doing. Um, he says, Socrates, you must understand what love is. 
And now he's going to give you a functional understanding of love. How does, how does it function? And he says, you know what? There are, again, hey, opposites. This is between these two is wisdom. Ignorance. And then he adds, this is the realm of the gods. This is the realm of mankind. And he said, look at the way love functions. He said, you know what men do? They offer up prayers and petitions to the gods. And in return, the gods then return to man. Gifts. What kinds of gifts? He says, requitals. He lets man off the hook. Well then, through these, these, through these dynamics pass then all the conversation between gods and men are through this medium. So all divination and the art of priests on sacrifices, and mysteries, incantations, right? and, uh, it, and it takes place in both awake and in sleep, all of these conversations take place. And of course, conversations in, split, in sleep are dreams. Now, <clears throat> when Socrates hears this, he said, that's pretty good. But uh, what is the origin? What, what's the origin of love? And it's nice to know this is the way it functions. But what's the origin of love? Well then, Gia Chaman says, hey, look, I got, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Now watch, origin. If love can be personified, if love can be personified into a person, we'll call him Eros. If he's personified, then he must have a father and a mother. So he's going to call the father plenty. And the mother, he's going to call the mother of love poverty. So now we have a family. Son, arrows, planting, the father. Now, <clears throat> once he does that, he then has to explain how love came into existence. And he creates this story. He says, hey, you know what? In the old days, all the gods got together to celebrate the birth of Aphrodite. All the gods came. It was a great festival. And it was at that time that uh, Plenty, she's broke. Poverty. And, hey. Poverty stricken. Hey, very much like ignorance. Hey, 
the qualities for the father turn out to be very much like knowledge. Only it's a special kind of knowledge. The father ends up being the logos. Okay, so what happens at the banquet? Hey, poverty sees the banquet and she stays by the doors leading to the banquet hall and she's looking for a handout or finding a way to get in. She's a smart girl. So what she sees is that coming out of this party, along comes plenty. And uh, he's been boozing it up. Uh, it was before wine was created, so he was using nectar and ambrosia. Pow! Right? There he is, knocked out, passed out. Then poverty said, hey, this is a good time. I can jump him. Right? There he is. I can jump and get pregnant. That's what I'll do. So, see, this only happens in myths because very often it's very unusual for men to be able to do it when they're passed out. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, are you an authority on that? <laughs> so she conceives Eros. And in this myth, it doesn't take nine months. Bang. Right? So out of that union comes Eros. Now Eros now decides to do what's most proper for Eros. He becomes an attendant and servant to Aphrodite. Hey, essentially that's the story. It's at this point that Plato then goes back to the structure and now talks about knowledge and wisdom. And it's very interesting. So I happen to have had, a, luckily enough, Okay. Now, by the way, what's most important in the story, which we may read in a few minutes, is that therefore love is a combination of all of the qualities of poverty and plenty, since he derives his nature from both of them. Therefore, so there's a description of what he inherits from each, and it's good. But I want to get back to this thing. Right. Okay. At the end of the myth of this poverty and plenty and love, the truth is this. Wait a minute. The truth of the hey, the truth of this, presumably the myth. <clears throat> no God seeks after wisdom or desires to become wise. <coughs> For wise he is already. Nor does anyone else seek after wisdom if he is wise already. And again, ignorance. The ignorant do not seek after wisdom, nor desire to become wise. For this is the worst of ignorance that one who is neither beautiful nor good nor intelligent should think himself good enough and therefore he does not desire it because he doesn't think he's lacking in what it is that he thinks he does not need. Right? Look here. That becomes the definition of these two things. 
So ignorance is not, right, it is not not knowing. It's assuming that you have, you're beautiful and intelligent enough, and that's enough for you, so you don't have to seek for anything. You're satisfied with where you are. That's the worst of ignorance. How's wisdom? Well, those who are wise don't pursue love. They don't pursue anything. They're wise already. They don't have to go seeking anything. So notice, he goes back to these two after he brackets out the myth. Curious? Sure. Now, this is, uh, this is the second paragraph. This is the third. Then Socrates says, hey, wait a minute. Uh, then who are the philosophers? Because it looks like they must be, be in between here. They must be in here. Giotima says, that's right, kid. Because philosophy means the love of wisdom. Love is a lack, it's a desire. Right. It's something that you desire. The thing you desire must be something that's beautiful. It's a lack, therefore you pursue it. Therefore, philosophers lack wisdom and they seek it. So Socrates then says, oh, that's what philosophy is. How to seek wisdom. That's the goal. See, that allows them, therefore, to go back to this and now he wants to unpack this, knowing or wisdom. And the rest of the dialogue is unpacking knowledge and wisdom as expressed through the idea of love. Now, <clears throat> uh, Plotinus doesn't do this. So he picks it up. He wants to unpack this. This is where Plotinus is. Right, this is what he wants to do. And he then picks up something here as well, you see, because he now has to talk about the divine gods and he has to talk about mankind, which is another way of talking about wisdom and ignorance. So therefore, what he's going to unpack is the impact love has on mankind so that he can then proceed through the medium to wisdom itself. That becomes the dialogue on the symposium. Now to do that, he then has uh, The whole thing, his whole speech, is 12 paragraphs. The conclusion is, is Socrates' uh, the implications of the speech you just gave. Therefore, the 11th paragraph is what is it like to experience this kind of thing called wisdom? 10 is the meta is the yoga of how to reach that state. All right? From nine, right, from four to nine, is a discussion about the role of love and nature among mankind, how it surfaces. 
So you have a whole critique about the nature of love. So Plotinus is going to pick up and he's going to explore that not in terms of the entire dialogue but in terms of the myth. So therefore I thought we could just, just get a couple of paragraphs read so it's fresh in your mind before we go into Plotinus. <laughs> I misunderstood. Are you saying that Plotinus is looking at these wisdom and ignorance uh, through the myth, or that he only focuses on the myth, um, which is uh, with respect to understanding and right opinion? That's I not, missed what you that, said. Not, I know try it's it not again. clear. Try, try it again. What is the role of myth for Plotinus? I misunderstood. I thought I understood it while you were doing this, but then I, I, it changed, so I... Plotinus is unpacking the myth. All right. Which is the third paragraph. Okay. But he's also focusing on the second paragraph as he's exploring the role of the gods or divinity and mankind. So, theoretically, in terms of material, he's really talking about paragraph 9 for mankind. But 8 is about nature itself. He doesn't go into the internal work of Socrates' speech. He's going to reserve his reflections, therefore, on this material plus those two ideas that he describes in the second paragraph. Okay? All right. Um, oh, I, uh, I, one of the major points in this, by the way, is this whole realm Socrates, uh, Giotima, his teacher, says, love is a spirit. It's in the realm of the spiritual. It's, it's not either of these two extremes. It's between them. That's where love functions. Okay. Uh, let me... Uh, It's such a lovely myth that uh, it's worthwhile making sure you know it before we go further. Um, um, it's one one paragraph. Oh, care to read for it? Sure. Thank you. Well, I get a drink or something. Okay, hold for a moment. Yes. Somewhere after the myth, about two or three C. About what? Two or three C. 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 Okay. okay, please go ahead. The myth, right? Here? The yes. Myth, the myth? Yeah. Okay. Which is the third paragraph. Okay. Who was his father? said I, and who was his mother? She answered, That is rather a long story. But still I will tell you, when Aphrodite was born, the gods held a feast, among them plenty, the son of never at a loss. When they had dined, poverty came in begging, as might be expected with all that good cheer, and hung about the doors. Plenty then got drunk on the nectar, for there was no wine yet, and went into Zeus's park all heavy, and fell asleep. 
So poverty, because of her penury, made a plan to have a child from plenty and lay by his side and conceived love. This is why love has become follower and servant of Aphrodite, having been begotten at her birthday party. And at the same time, he is by nature a lover busy with beauty, because Aphrodite is beautiful. Then, since love is the son of plenty and poverty, he gets his fortunes from them. First, he is always poor. Far from being tender and beautiful, as most people think, he is hard and rough and unshod and homeless, lying always on the ground without bedding, sleeping by the doors and in the streets in the open air, having his mother's nature, always dwelling with want. But from his father, again, he has designs upon beautiful and good things, being brave and go-ahead and high-strung, a mighty hunter, always weaving devices, and a successful coveter of wisdom, a philosopher all his days, a great wizard and sorcerer and sophist. He was born neither mortal nor immortal, but on the same day sometimes he is blooming and alive, when he has plenty, but sometimes he's dying. Then again he gets new life through his father's nature, but what he procures in plenty always trickles away, so that love is not in want nor in wealth. And again, he is between wisdom and ignorance. That's a bite. Is that your bite? <laughs> no. Okay, go ahead. Just finish the last line. Uh, I think that was it. Uh, so that love is not in wants nor in wealth, and again, he is between wisdom and ignorance. And the truth is, go ahead. The truth is this. No God seeks after wisdom or desires to become wise, for wise he is already. Nor does anyone else seek after wisdom if he is wise already. And again, the ignorant do not seek after wisdom, nor desire to become wise. For this is the worst of ignorance, that one who is neither beautiful and good nor intelligent should think himself good enough. So he does not desire it, because he does not think he is lacking in what he does not think he needs. Good. All right. You know what we can do now? We can take this piece of work of Plotinus and literally cut out sections of it and paste it right along the middle. You've got some extra copies? <laughs> no. Because that's what he's doing. And there but, are copies here for anybody who needs to Pardon? Where? There are copies here. Yeah. This is a free. Now the whole thing is 17 pages, I cut it in half, all right, because the last seven pages go even into more detail about the myth. So let's just take a look at how he proceeds, all right. Um, so, look, starts out, hey, you know what? Three possibilities. Yep. There it is. Uh, left to be a god, could be a spirit, could be an affection of human affections. And then he's going to talk about the source of it. Right? He's going to show how it functions. To do that, he's going to use the myth. So, uh, just that here. Right, Helen. That word affection is the word experience, no. right? It's really what the soul is undergoing. Just that's I good pathos, good old pathos. Yeah. Uh, so he's going to start out, but uh, he's going to start out with mankind. Uh, 
So I'm in the middle of the first page. Let's take, take a look at it. Let me give you a few minutes to look at it. Uh, Is that the next? Therefore, on the one hand, concerning the pathos, the affection for which we make love the cause, that arises in souls who long to be engaged with some beauty, and that this longing on the one hand, is that which comes from those who are of sound mind, good old Sophronicus, who have found their home in beauty itself. Whereas on the other hand, without a doubt, no one is ignorant of that which uh, wants to find its fulfillment in some ugly act. Okay? Pick it up from there, read yourself for a few minutes. Okay, for a few minutes, uh, let me introduce you to another phase of the problem. <clears throat> There's a kind of struggle or a war very clearly in Plotinus. He is going to claim that the problem man has is in physical love 
or sexuality. He re expresses that in a variety of ways, and we'll see it in the text. It's also in Plato, same thing, except in the Republic. Except in the Republic, it's not there. Second, it's not in the Republic or the Thedo. Did you say the problem is or isn't sexuality? Isn't, isn't in the Republic. No, no. The problem, except in his republic. But in, in all the other works, the problem is or isn't physical pleasure. Yeah, I'm trying to say that. I'm asking. Is. Is. Okay? Is that better? But he argues for the sexual and the republic and the federal. Okay? Why? Why on the federal? Because of the baby dangling on the dangling on me of Socrates when he's He's seven years old, he's going to die on the day of his death. He's talking about his recent child at 70, right? Therefore, would you agree it looks like he must have been doing something to have a child? I agree. Are you familiar with that kind of activity? I am, okay. yes. Then you can assert that that's likely. That's likely. Or po positively. And he wants to be represented. Okay. Wants to represent him. Yeah. I had several places in the Republic. Right because both men and women can be philosopher kings and they, they come together for families and obviously he talks about the value of raising children and therefore he can't be against sexuality if he's interested in raising children by the same reason. But that's minor. Compared to, yeah, no, what do you got? In the symposium too, does he say they should pursue beautiful bodies? But that's what we, that's what we want to look at. Thank you. Is it in the symposium? Right. No. Uh, now it's important that you notice this in the Republic. If you take a look at Book Four. in the Republic, he talks about and he explores the idea of bravery or courage. It's a very beautiful section. But to decipher what he means, you have to link it into book two. So, and, uh, essentially what he's saying in book four and two, uh, he calls it the great lie. He says, hey, there's a great lie that both gods and men hate.
And the way he describes it is, hey, you know what? If you have a false view about the nature of reality, right, and if you cultivate that, that's the worst possible lie. There's no greater lie than that. That brings all kinds of chaos and confusion to your, into your world. Okay. What is, what is that? How does that relate? He says, you have to keep your mind, you have to keep your mind on the nature of reality. And whatever you do, it doesn't make any difference what you do. You have to be able to hold on fast to the notion of ultimate reality in whatever you do then whatever you do is perfectly appropriate and that he then shows can be linked to justice because that's the grounds for justice. Hey, reality. In this work, he's, go he's going to show that there's a yoga, there's a spiritual yoga in paragraph 10 of how to achieve an insight into the nature of ultimate reality. The description of that ultimate reality is paragraph 11. Therefore, hey, that's what he means. If you can hold on to the nature of reality and whatever you're doing, that's being just. Therefore, he doesn't have a war against sexuality or anything else. Because his one standard is keep your mind on the nature of reality and whatever you're doing, and do what you're doing, and it'll work out. Okay, so what's the value of it? The whole thing depends upon knowing what the nature of reality is. And in this, in this work that we're dealing with, the symposium, which Plotinus is now going to open up, that's the key. And therefore, you know what? You want to make sure you take a look at paragraph 11 which is the description of ultimate reality because that is the high point in the myth. Why? Hey, um, that's just a simple question. Um, what's the meaning, try this, what's the meaning of the birth of Aphrodite? The gods are holding a celebration. Something like the supernal outpouring of divine luminosity from the one mm, getting like that. that all the gods that get to participate in that throughout all eternity. Okay. Use that. Can someone add to it? Something about beauty? Or is it, is it a first glimpse? Is it the no. birth of beauty comes when you get a Kensho? That, that's true. Now, now put it back on the myth, see? The question is, why are the gods celebrating the birth of Aphrodite? Hold on to what you're saying. Well, if you're having trouble with it, you know, we can just ask Brad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I was just thinking because it's good. Okay, this question in Plotinus is central, and he's going to open up for it. He's going to open it up for us. Great. Okay. Uh, he's also going to open up the significance of what does it mean for plenty to be passed out on nectar and ambrosia? 
He's going to unpack all of the symbols in the myth. And he does a very good job. But we want to know, how did it all begin? Well, it all began with the birth of Aphrodite. The gods held a celebration. No, what it got a shot? I'm embarrassed to say, I remember doing this in your class like a decade ago, <laughs> and I had all those answers for all the questions you're thinking of, and I had a few more that you used to go, and I can't remember anymore. Yes. <laughs> 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 He doesn't have to remember, he can just guess. Okay, let's try something now. Okay, you guys have been reading it. Pick out any phrase or, or sentences, and we can just stick it in this model, can't we? Try it. Okay. Good. Hey. Uh, four. Go, let's everybody get the four. Hold right it. Past 15, hold it, hold it, hold about it. Three quarters through. Hold it. It's four between uh, three and five. Sorry, it actually says two at the top and four at the bottom. Okay, go ahead. And it's about three quarters through, about for 15. Um, the former one is motherless and beyond marriages, since there are no marriages in heaven. Thus the heavenly one who is said to be born of the mind of Kronos, that one must be the most divine soul. She is unmingled by being the immediate emanation of the unmingled itself. Right, uh, we got a good good part. It fits right into a model, does it not? Yeah. Okay, keep going. Well, she abides above since she neither wills nor was she willing nor will she ever be capable of descending to things here below since she never developed the downward inclination to things below <clears throat> okay uh, by the way he goes into the two kinds of love heavenly aphrodite and earthly aphrodite and that's not in, the, in socrates's speech uh, but that's in, in another place, in one of the speeches, we'll leave that alone. What did you discover about this very issue with Aphrodite? Come on, there's a key part. Therefore, it is said that love was born both from her or along with her. Right? See? From, come on, from her and along with her. Now, he has to make that clear. It's a great idea, right? That's in the nature of Aphrodite, that love is from her and along with her. So we need more, don't we? Um, so that first part, is referencing the higher fold of the twofold. Is that right? So that's why she's justly called a goddess at that point. Not a uh, spirit by being unmixed and pure, by abiding in herself. So she's adding one more thought, is it not? It has to happen at the uh, simultaneously, <coughs> same time. So in our myth, you could cut this off, you could stick it right in here, and you can keep reading and do it with all the other sections. Then you can see how well he's doing, can't you? 
you can see what he accepts, what he ignores. Uh, now, you can go down to the heavenly one. Same, par- same paragraph, same page. So, he's into mythology, so uh, the mind of Zeus, the mind of Zeus is Kronos. And the, the father of Kronos is Uranus. So, so, often called heaven, but it's Uranus. So what? Hey, uh, in the idea of God as a creator, or a maker, he reflects upon himself and uses that as the model for all creation. Hey, therefore, the idea in the mind of God is equivalent to this statement in Greek mythology, the mind of Zeus. So the mind, the mind of Zeus is the it's the intelligibility of the mind of Zeus that's being used for all creation. So when he now talks about the mind of Zeus, when you want to talk about this in isolation, the mind of Zeus, not Zeus, you're talking about Kronos. Therefore, Kronos in Greek mythology is the, is the IG in the mind of God, or the most intelligible model of all things. Hey, uh, it itself must have had a cause. Uranus. What does that mean? Well, because if it does exist, if it does exist, there must be a cause for all things that exist. That's Uranus. So you'll see the way he's using this language that this is what it presupposes. Okay, let's go back. Uh, Aphrodite is, come on, is motherless. What's significant about that? Um, Motherless beyond marriages because it's born from that high lofty sense, the one that must be that one, that Aphrodite, must be a divine soul. Oh, hey. Uh, what did he just do? He said, hey, you know what this is? 
Therefore, this is the divine soul. Now in terms of our model, So Aphrodite, that's in our birth on, on this model. So Aphrodite then becomes to be called a divine soul. So what are we doing? We're cutting out sections and we're gluing. That's all we're doing. So let's get a couple of more good quotes. Come on, there's a lot of good ones. What do you say? You work all right. Now, um, I just want to uh, finish that last thought, okay? <clears throat> um, Okay, a divine soul or Aphrodite is called the underlying reality and usia, right? which he calls essential being. Okay, therefore, Aphrodite is the underlying reality. That has a particular property that turns upon itself, it can know itself, it can experience itself through all kinds of levels. Therefore, he's adding to the notion of reality a dynamic. has that property to see it turning upon itself. I'm at the bottom of page four. And because of that, She's a goddess. Right? Ah! So, she's also a goddess. Because of those two factors, that makes a goddess. Okay, come on. Read a couple of nice quotes. How about it? Thank you. You read the next one? Yeah, anywhere you want to go. In full time. Yeah. Um, I don't have one at the moment. Okay. Got one? One, two. What? Well, I, I would just continue from there. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, she would also justly be called a goddess and not a spirit by being unmixed and pure, by abiding in herself. For that which springs immediately, directly from mind, must itself also be a pure nature, inasmuch as she is strong according to herself by her immediate proximity, and inasmuch as her desire and also her proximate foundation are both directed toward her author, who is sufficient to maintain her above, from which source the soul can never fall, by being immediately suspended from mind, even more proximate than the sun could hold the light that he shines forth from himself, the outpouring from himself that is still held firmly to him. Surely then by following Kronos, or if you wish, by following heaven, the father of Kronos, the soul both directs her energy towards him, and also in that keen loving she gives birth to love, and along with this, she gazes steadfastly towards him. And so this energy of the soul has produced an underlying reality and an essential being. And both mother and child intently look there. And so who, the one who gave birth and beautiful love, the underlying reality who has come to be, always arranged in relation to another beauty, 
and by having its existence in this way, just as if it existed between the longing and the object of that yearning, period. So on the one hand, it is the eye of the one who yearns, which provides the power through which the lover sees the object of their yearning. But on the other hand, love himself runs ahead, and before he hands over to the lover the power of seeing through the organ of sight, on the one hand, he fills himself with the vision, but certainly not in the same way of seeing. On the one hand, he firmly fixes in the lover the spectacle, but on the other hand, he himself plucks the fruit of the vision of beauty as it keenly speeds past him. Right. The object of longing back moves on to man. Right? And therefore, we now can cut that out, we can stick it where man is. Right. Hey, um, let me go back to this curious uh, <clears throat> um, You have to play for this one. Okay, you have to play for this one. Oh. Um, hey, right? You think that uh, divine luminosity ought to be a pretty interesting thing to experience? Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yes. Oh. Say, so, whatever gave birth to that, do you think if there were gods around, they'd be celebrating it? Absolutely. That's what he's doing. That's what he thinks. <clears throat> That's the beginning of the myth. God held a feast at the birth of Aphrodite. Aphrodite represents that divine luminosity. Therefore, it's natural that all the gods would come and have a party. Why, at the same time, is love there? Bradley says, because it's beautiful. Yeah. And what happens with that stuff? Love. Hunger. <laughs> right? Everyone wants to hunger. They don't experience it. So therefore, simultaneously, with the birth of beauty, the nature of love must naturally arrive simultaneously with it. Yeah, and Plotinus gives us a way of understanding that by bringing in the eye, right? The eye that beholds the vision. That's right. You're not going to have a birth of beauty without someone seeing it. Yeah, yeah. 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 He says, uh... Page? What, uh... It's... Number three... Page what page? Right? It's at the bottom page. I don't know if uh, page is at my bottom, but I have number three... The, three. Thank you. Yeah, three. Okay, hold on. Uh, if it's at the bottom, it's the page number, I think. They didn't the, print the out the numbers, numbers are section numbers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Like section number. Three is page six. Yeah. Section number three. Page six. Page six. And, uh, okay. so I have three quotes. Uh, what, you, what we were just talking about there on uh, uh, 320, uh, two lines down from 20, it says, the separation of that soul is said to be the primary illumination of the heavens. Cut it out, stick it there. Right. Take some more, and then I have yeah. two, sure. two more at the top, uh, at uh, 310, that uh, says, or excuse me, yeah, it would be two lines down for 310. Therefore, from that which is intensely energetic in regards to the object of vision, and from a kind of outward emanation from the object of vision, love was born. Okay, David? Yeah, he has a couple of problems that he brings up. One is why at the same time of love was born with Aphrodite and from Aphrodite. Yes. 
and also the problem of cause and kinship. Yes. And he does a nice job right at the top of page six in, yeah. in really getting to the, so far, yeah. the fundament, fundamental nature of that cause and kinship. Yeah. That's so I'll read it. Yeah. Yeah, it, takes a bit. Yeah. It, it, it takes a bit. Yeah. Do you mind? Yeah, could you read the quote? Yeah, okay. Thus, that love is an underlying reality and an essential being that arose from an essential being that is on the one hand less than the one who produced her, but is nevertheless on the other hand not to be rightfully distrusted. But since that soul was an essential being which arose from the energy of the one who is prior to her, and from the essential being of the real beings and looks towards that which was the first essential being, she continues looking with great intensity. And it was the first spectacle. And it was the first spectacle, and she was looking towards this as if towards her own good. And she was rejoicing by looking and the spectacle was such as to make it impossible for the visionary soul to make the vision a secondary activity, so that the soul, by being a kind of pleasure, and by her intense contemplation upon the vision itself, she would beget an offspring from herself, mm -hmm. and worthy of herself, and of the object of her looking, mm -hmm. cause and kinship. That's it. Uh, That's the line. In and from. That's the good line. No. Wow. Please. Oh, I, I don't know. Are you finished? I, I just wanted to add something to that, but I didn't want to stop you. Uh, no, I just had that little bit because I wanted to share that, but there's certainly more. So sure. Well, in what you were just reading, I just wanted to say that there is that word contemplation by her intense contemplation upon the vision itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... I just, it just heart, it just, uh, it points to this as being like a yoga, a contemplative system. Like when you recognize that it's like you are doing that, you are, you are that personifying that and, and looking back with that intense contemplation upon the vision, right? And, and what, and because you are a visionary soul, right, that is a primary thing and you don't make it a secondary activity. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Good advice. So, look here. <clears throat> um. If you're lucky, I think he's talking about his own experience. <laughs> well, he, this is a vision sufficient to make the soul a hypostasis. Yes. But what does that mean? So now he's a hypostasis. Go ahead. Come on, you can do it. Yeah. He's well, real. The soul, or the soul, she is real for the first time. Right. <coughs> right. Now look here. We're talking about ultimate reality. We're talking about beauty. Let's look at the way he describes it in the 11th paragraph. Would you agree we have a reader right here? Yeah. That, this guy is the best reader. Yeah, I don't want to be the reader guy, though. But you're good. <laughs> okay, now this is what I used to say. All right? <laughs> Don't limit me. Okay, here it goes. We're going to do the whole thing. Whoever shall be guided so far towards the mysteries of love by contemplating beautiful things rightly in due order is approaching the last grade. Suddenly, he will behold a beauty marvelous in its nature. That very beauty, Socrates, for the sake of which all the earlier hardships have been born. In the first place, everlasting, and never being born nor perishing, neither increasing nor diminishing. Secondly, not beautiful here and ugly there, not beautiful now and ugly then, not beautiful in one direction and ugly in another direction, not beautiful in one place and ugly in another place. Again, this beauty will not show itself to him like a face or hands or any bodily thing at all, nor as a discourse or a science, nor indeed as residing in anything as in a living creature or an earth or heaven or anything else, 
but being by itself, with itself, always, in simplicity. While all the beautiful things elsewhere partake of this beauty in such manner that when they are born and perish, it becomes neither less nor more, and nothing at all happens to it. So that when anyone by right, youth loving, goes up from these beautiful things to that beauty and begins to catch sight of it, he would almost touch the perfect secret. For let me tell you, the right way to approach the things of love or to be led there by another is this, beginning from these beautiful things to mount for that beauty's sake ever upwards, as by a flight of steps, from one to two and from two to all beautiful bodies, and from beautiful bodies to beautiful pursuits and practices, and from practices to beautiful learnings, so that from learnings, he may come at last to that perfect learning, which is the learning solely of that beauty itself, and may know at last that which is the perfection of beauty. There in life and there alone, my dear Socrates, said the inspired woman, is life worth living for man, while he contemplates beauty itself. If ever you see this, it will seem to you to be far above gold and raiment and beautiful boys and men, whose beauty you are now entranced to see, and you and many others are ready so long as they see their darlings and remain ever with them, if it could be possible not to eat nor drink, but only to gaze at them and to be with them. What indeed, she said, should we think, if it were given to one of us to see beauty undefiled, pure, unmixed, not adulterated with human flesh and colors and much other mortal rubbish, and if he could behold beauty in perfect simplicity. Do you think it a mean life for a man, she said, to be looking tither and <clears throat> contemplating that and abiding with it? Okay, look, these are the steps leading to that vision, and the one word that it culminates in is knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge. So this then is the culmination of the kinds of knowledge he's experiencing in the next paragraph. Go ahead. Do you not reflect that there only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind, which alone can, which see, it. Alone can see it, to give birth not to likenesses of virtue, since he touches no likeness, but to reality, since he touches reality. And when he has given birth to real virtue and brought it up, will it not be granted him to be the friend of God and immortal if any man ever is? It's about as good as it gets. Pretty nice? Yes. Yeah. So that's his description. All right. These are the steps. Each one as it proceeds a greater and greater scope of knowledge of beauty culminating in that vision, which is ultimate reality, which in fact is going back. Hey. It's going back to knowledge. Yes. The, whole, the whole thing is caught right here. Because you can say the steps between them are in fact the steps. This is the vision. That re also represents Aphrodite. So he brings it all together. So the idea of knowledge underlies the whole thing. Right? So would you not agree this is a good place to start this work on Platonics? Yeah. All right? Quick. Thank you. So we're coming back to this. Yeah, by the way, any dreams? Liam? Got one? I know you have a dream in your hands. Barbara, wasn't there one more correction made after this one? Where, um, yes, there was. Okay. Boy, I'm glad I didn't 
print out the first two. I printed out, I got it in 723, the last edition came out. How'd you wear them? How are you? So, good. so, good. Good. Good.